states around this country don't understand what the Hunt Institute has brought to the state, but also to all of us in our own states as well. She is, um, works collaboratively in the areas of economic development in um, galvanizing leaders around emerging issues in health, education, environment, the economy. She is, talks about consensus and building policy change. She is, by, um, by education and work, um, a lawyer and has worked in government. Um, but the most important thing that she can do for us today is to continue this conversation and our transition from what we've heard, what we've learned, what we now know STEM is, without the, some of those myths, into what we actually will do as we, as we leave um, and being more vital in, in change for STEM education. Anita. Well, thank you very much, Jan, and good afternoon to all of you. So I want to confess to feeling a little bit of pressure this afternoon, unusual pressure. The last time I had the opportunity to speak to a group that included a lot of teachers, I was in Chapel Hill speaking to the Worldview Conference. And I made some off-the-cuff remark about my mother-in-law, who is a teacher in Bladen County, who had promised me that she was going to retire so that she could spend more time helping me with her grandchildren. I said something like she probably decided when they hit middle school she didn't like them that much and so she's refused. I haven't seen her since. <laughs> I left the Friday Institute, went outside to my car, and there was a text message from my mother-in-law saying, I hear you've been talking about me in Chapel Hill. <laughs> so I want you all to promise me, no matter what I say, that you're not going to tell on me. I actually am really excited to be here and was really um, moved by the sessions I had an opportunity to eavesdrop on this morning. And let me tell you why. Because I spend all my time in rooms with people who are talking about the exact same issues you are confronting, but they're talking about it on the back end of the pipeline. They're talking about what STEM means to the economy of North Carolina and its sister states. They're talking about what our workforce pipeline must be in order for this country to remain competitive. They're focused on what it means for our innovation quotient to be declining relative to other nations. And I was thinking this morning, if half the people who I usually sit in rooms with had the opportunity to sit and listen to what is happening in classrooms, in schools, in districts across this country, we would stop fretting so much. So let me thank you, first of all, for the leadership that you are inspiring in the places where it matters. But I do think that the fact that these folks are sweating suggests that not only do we need to lift the curtain from the work that you are doing so that more people have the opportunity to see it, to understand it, to be inspired by it. The very title of this conference makes clear that you yourselves recognize that we've got to do much more, much faster, with much greater impact if we are to win in this innovation race. The three things that I hear a lot from business leaders, and I heard this today echoed in various rooms, are this. We got to have a greater pipeline. We need more students graduating through the system with STEM disciplines and the kind of skills, the ones that you all just mentioned, problem solving, critical thinking, risk taking, and we need them coming faster. The reality is that it isn't going to happen just in our P through 12 schools, nor is it just going to happen in the way our universities are recalibrating their STEM disciplines. We've got to have a pipeline that fits together much more clearly and transparently so that students have an opportunity to matriculate through that system easily. The second thing I want to say about that pipeline is as we look at the demographic trends of this country, part of the challenge all of us are going to face is making sure that all students have an opportunity to avail themselves of the kind of educational um, 
pre preparation that's going to make them competitive in the workforce. The Carnegie uh, Institute in New York refers to this as a democracy imperative. And given the kind of work that we do at the Institute for Emerging Issues, looking at the overall social and economic competitiveness of this state, I actually think they're right. We've got to go to where our potential workforce is, and we have to make sure that everyone has the opportunity. And then the final thing I want to say, Jan, before um, I give you a chance to ask some more questions is, what I hear business leaders saying is, as we think about our pipeline, it can't just be a P through 16 pipeline. They have to be connected at the end of that pipeline. For the last couple of years, the Institute for Emerging Issues has focused on issues like energy and infrastructure and healthcare innovations. Last February, which was only just a month ago, feels like a year, we had a big conference on the future of manufacturing in the United States and all of the jobs that are going to be created in this new industrial revolution. And what we hear from companies is, it isn't enough for students just to be able to check the box on skills. We need those skills to feel more aligned with what businesses need to be competitive immediately <coughs> upon these students being hired. So I think there's all sorts of opportunity to take the great seeds of what's happening, all the innovation I've heard in this conference, and to think about how we ratchet it up a bit in order to ensure that our communities, that our states, that our country continues to be innovative. You've mentioned a lot of important pieces based on what you've seen. Um, I think you mentioned at the beginning that it was important to take the curtain up. And for, for folks who are in the audience, the work that they do in their districts, their nonprofits, and wherever they happen to find the work, their, their focus, to be in the forefront of the conversation in North Carolina. What's the Emerging Institutes doing in order to enable that? So. Um, as many of you know, each year we pick one issue that we think the state of North Carolina has to give specific focus to, and we bring together in small and large groups, the largest being the Emerging Issues Forum, which we'll have between 1,000 and 1,200 people each February. We expose people to the best thinking internationally and nationally, and then we call the question, on what North Carolina needs to be doing to be more competitive. I've said to a couple of you, um, we're going to take the biggest risk, because you know, talking about manufacturing or creativity or energy, is small potatoes when you consider that next year we're going to focus on what it means for North Carolina to have a globally competitive teaching workforce. That will be the topic of the forum. I think it's high time that the teachers in this room and the superintendents in this room are sitting in the same room with the business leaders in the state, with the policy leaders in the state, and developing a consensus agenda for how we move ourselves forward. That's where we'll be. So let's fast forward then. And be because many of us, in this first row, work very closely with new schools yes. um, in planning this conference on a yearly basis and in trying to be most vital to the constituency in front here. If that's the case, then what's the title for this conference for next year? How do we serve, best serve our own? So my hope would be that coming out of the Emerging Issues Forum, we would have a good feel for what the policy prescriptions need to be in the state in order to create an environment for more teachers to do the amazing stuff that I've already heard is happening here. But policy prescriptions isn't the same thing as practice in the classrooms. And so while we can create that environment, what you do that we can't do is help teachers to have best practices, support mechanisms, the sort of things that allow you to go in and to be in the classrooms, what everybody recognizes is essential to the future of North Carolina. Good news, that's good news. I'm but happy to give you work anytime you want it. Actually, I think that's a good thing. <laughs> that's a good thing for all of us. Um, and what, what's really been very key in, in the conversations here, as um, we've all gone from, from different sessions to different sessions, is that almost to a one, they've penetrated down to speaking about students. The community of students, 
um, families and the difference that we have to make for them to understand their space in this world in North Carolina and where the access points are for their own voice, for them to have to be the imperative that they're part of, of designing their own education, but also that they think things are, have at, they have access That's to right. them That's and right. that they're capable and that they're literate. How does this then penetrate to the kids and to the community? So let me say something about where students today are. I have two daughters. One is 17, and uh, um, she at least believes she's ready to take on the whole world. <laughs> The other is 14. I'm afraid for my children. Because when I think about all of the pieces of advice that my parents gave to me, it's difficult for me to know which pieces of those are still relevant today. We are matriculating a generation of young people who are going to confront a world that is markedly different from the world that we, sitting in this room, grew up in. And so when you ask a question about the child-centeredness of it all, what it means to prepare young people, it strikes me that as a teacher or administrator in a school, there is more pressure for you to feel and be connected to these larger macro forces so that you are able to communicate those to kids. It isn't just enough to give them good content. I've heard many people today talk about relevance. Well, relevance has to be connected to the real world in which they will graduate. And so I don't suggest by any stretch of the imagination that this is easy work. But as a parent, I'm hopeful that the teachers for my two daughters are helping them to understand exactly the kinds of 21st century skills that will be required for a world that will constantly change before them. As we were doing this forum on manufacturing, I was struck by one statistic. It used to be, and I like to tell myself that I'm actually not that old, um, that you were told to prepare yourself for two or three careers in your lifetime. I'm of a family where my father had one job. He worked for one company for 30 years. I've had four. My children will likely have 12. So as you think about what that means, the kind of adaptable skills and agility that you are preparing these young people for is something on, for, on scene in times gone by. And I'm actually pretty excited coming out of these sessions this morning that I hear lots of people who are recognizing that and wanting to give these kids these competencies, but we're gonna have to continue to make sure that they understand how those competencies are preparing them for the world ahead. Thank you. It, we are all going after this session, we're going to go see innovation, innovative schools. Um, instead of taking us all out on buses and going out, um, we thought this year with the numbers, it would be better if they came here. Good. And so in, in watching and listening and engaging with them, how, how do we have a different set of questions? We were challenged earlier yesterday to make sure that our questions had why in it. Um, how do we, what are the good questions we should be asking of those schools that we see having results with kids? So I really think um, that innovation will consistently be about more process than it will be about product. Um, people ask me all the time, what is the next big bet for North Carolina? And I know that there are schools that are focusing kids on healthcare careers or focusing kids on special technical skills, and I think that's great. But remembering what I said about how often these kids are likely to change careers in a lifetime, it is the process of learning, the love of learning, the willingness to take risks around learning that will differentiate those schools that are truly innovative from those that are just talking about innovation. Well, that's our job. That's our challenge. So we're ready to do it. Let's do it. Thanks so much. And I want to remind everybody that after we do spend some time in those sessions, 
to please come back. Emily DiRocco is going to talk with us about making the transition further to workforce and what it means ec in an economic sense to North Carolina this afternoon. Thanks so much, Nita. Appreciate yeah, thank the Thank you effort. very much for having me. I do want to just make one sure. correction. Um, Governor Jim Hunt, a guy who has never been want of many innovations, has two institutes. One is the Hunt Institute, which is part of UNC General right. Administration, and then the Institute for Emerging Issues, which is where I work. While I'm happy to take full credit for the Hunt <laughs> Institute's work, <clears throat> since I just told you the story about the text message to my mother-in-law, I want to make sure that nobody's that texting that I'm taking credit for the <laughs> Hunt well, we're Institute. We're delighted you were here from the Emerging Issues Institute. Thank you very Thanks much. So it was much. great Take to care. be here.